first podcast, and I have an article about sheep hunting, one of my favorite activities <laughs> many years ago. <laughs> it's high, it's steep, it's difficult, and it is absolutely glorious. The kind of habitat that our native wild mountain sheep live in is inspiring in and of itself. And when you throw those big, beautiful horned animals into the mix, man, is it a treat. Throw on the backpack or pack the horses, but get on out there because sheep are special. This is an article that was published in a 2001 hunting annual. and I don't even know who the publisher was. All this says on here is hunting annual. So who knows whose annual it was? But the story is about some of my sheep hunts, I would assume. Uh, so it goes with sheep is the title of this one. And I see pictures of dolls, rams, and bighorn rams, and glassing up in the mountains with my buddy Mark and packing out a, an Idaho ram. So I think we'll just read the story and find out what happened. This is how it goes. When I left the tent at dawn, the guide and packer were softly snoring, and the world was a narrow band of ice and gravel beneath a low blanket of gray cloud. There was no grass. There were no trees. There wasn't even a horizon. Just undulating humps of white and blue glacier ice capped with a fog lid. Less than a mile away, though I did not see it, lay a white sheep with wide curling amber horns, horns that had been fattened and lengthened for ten years. Horns that made this ram master of his glacial world, king of an ancient ice and rock wilderness carved from the towering, wrangled mountains. This great ram, as yet unseen, had unknowingly slept within a mile of the predator that would soon claim him. A North American sheep hunt is so much more than a quest for magnificent horns. Those ornaments are instead a reminder of your journey, a memento of your great adventure. The hunt itself is the real trophy. Thievery, fire, or divorce may take the horns, but the memory stays with you, buoys you, perhaps even changes you. For sheep hunting demands commitment, perseverance, hard work, self-control, superb shooting skills, and sometimes a healthy dose of suffering. In return, it repays delight, excitement, adventure, the thrill of discovery, aesthetic pleasure, and a deep, satisfying sense of accomplishment. My major investment in my 1995 glacier sheep hunt were hard work, self-control, and shooting skill. Adventure and aesthetic delight were its lasting rewards. We were able to ride horses 10 miles from Terry Overly's camp to the toe of a great glacier. Then we backpacked just eight miles up what proved to be a wilderness superhighway. Atop a glacier, there are no tangled roots or tough grasses to plow through, no spongy tundra to negotiate, no limbs to duck, no peaks to scale. Now and then, we detour around a deep crevasse or climb the lateral moraine of loose rock and gravel, but mostly we had solid footing and easy walking up a gradual, slightly undulating incline of ice shot through with gravel. With winds light and sun shining, it was better than a walk in the park. The vistas were stunning, if not sublime. The great white frozen river sprawled before us, edged by black walls of gravel and boulders surmounted by continuous lines of dark, jagged mountain ridges. Far upstream, beneath roiling clouds that blew to tattered white rags before evaporating, the highest peaks stood smothered in perpetual snow, its weight pouring down to feed the glacier. Even that lamentable fog, the bane of sheep hunters, heightened the mystery of wilderness. Though I couldn't hunt until it cleared, I could dream. Were wolves trotting just beyond that wall of gray? Were giant rams picking their way along the rocky slopes above? Was a grizzly sauntering along the ice on a collision course with our fragile tent? Once the fog lifted, my young, over-eager guide abruptly crested a tundra ridge and spooked some ewes, and they in turn spooked some distant rams. 
we were forced to race around the mountain shoulder to intercept them. Running through deep gravel with rifle and pack isn't the easy or best way to get ready for a long shot. By the time we relocated our quarry on broken ledges above us, my legs and lungs were competing to see which hurt worse. If at that moment I had let emotion get the better of me, I'd have taken and missed a hasty shot. Instead, thanks to 30 years of hunting experience, I had the presence of mind to pause, take several deep breaths, and assess my options. By their actions, we knew the rams hadn't seen us. By experience, we guessed they'd feel safe now that they stood considerably higher than the site of their initial fright. A short climb above me lay a large, flat-topped boulder, a perfect support for my Rifles Inc. lightweight rifle. I sucked three more big drafts of air and drove my burning legs into loose scree that slid me back one half foot for every foot I gained, but the reward was worth the effort. Despite my crashing heart, the boulder steadied the rifle. What do you think? 325 or more? I whispered to my guide. Oh, I'd say at least 350. How are you sighted in? Three inches high at 100. Only three inches low at 300. Then, knowing the thin air and the steep angle would contribute to a higher than normal hit, plus the fact that I usually overestimate a target's distance, I held slightly above on center with the shoulder. At the shot, the ram collapsed, struck in the spine. If I hadn't gotten in shape prior to that hunt by hiking steep hills under a 40-pound pack for several weeks, I'd have never caught up to that ram. If I hadn't known my rifle and ammunition and how they performed at long range, I'd have missed. In sheep hunting, you reap what you sow. Now that I think about it, perseverance seems the main ingredient in most of my seven sheep hunts. During my first, a do-it-yourself trip in Idaho's River of No Return Wilderness, I backpacked 17 miles into camp and lived alone in a tent for 13 days before even seeing a ram. The emotional strain on that hunt was worse than the physical. Snort in derision if you must, but it's psychologically stressful living alone for two weeks in rugged mountains, a hard day's hike from the trailhead. The more time you spend isolated, the more you begin to dwell on the possibility that the next rock might break free. What would you do if you broke your leg? The bear and cougar tracks you see in daylight grow larger when the campfire dies. The muffled thump of your heart in your ears grows loud until, what was that? Did it skip a beat? And then you remember your appendix. It's still in there. Fortunately, the exhaustion of each day's hunt brings sleep quickly despite your paranoia, and sunrise brings renewed optimism. Sunshine makes a major difference on a sheep hunt, as I learned on my first and second doll hunts in the Alaska Range. For two days, skies remained clear while guide Philip Esai and I climbed. August temperatures were warm, the tundra was green, and the scenery was spectacular. It was almost too idyllic for serious hunting. Well, that all changed on the third day. As we climbed and glassed, clouds glided in so gradually that we almost didn't notice until late evening. Then, realizing that we could get caught in rain and fog that would reduce visibility to a few hundred yards at best, and the last four days, well, I became frantic to find a ram. Instead of descending to build a comfortable camp out of the wind, I insisted we cross one more ridge, one more peak, and yet another. Light lasted until nearly 11 p.m., and I knew that we had to take advantage of it. Never mind that we had already been hiking for 16 hours. Our persistence paid off. From that last peak, I spotted a good ram and minutes later was firing at him as he tried to escape over the next ridge. Again, previous shooting practice and a good rifle paid dividends. I had to hit that sheep at more than 300 yards as it ran. Fortunately, Philip was there to call my shots. By adjusting my hold accordingly, I parked the third bullet where it counted, and none too soon, moments later, it began to drizzle. Within a half hour, it was dark. We scratched out level bunks in the scree, crawled under a nylon tarp. The next morning, we packed up and hiked out 
through eight miles of fog. Surprisingly, clear, sunny skies aren't always ideal for sheep hunting. During my hunt for California bighorn in Idaho's Owyhee County Desert, too much sunshine almost fried me. Here's how. It was mid-morning on the third day of our hunt. Alan Sands and I were crawling through desert sage. We'd already hiked several miles, crossed a 500-foot canyon, and forded a river. Now we were trying to slip away from a heavily broomed ram that had been glaring at us for too long. We needed to circle around to reach bigger rams beyond. We left our packs stacked as decoys, sliding backward and keeping them between us and the sheep, and it worked. After several hundred yards, we dropped into a cut and were finally free to stand. The rams we had spotted earlier were gone. While attempting to relocate them, we had inadvertently bumped them sending the entire band down and across the gorge. As they fled, they alarmed every other ram on our side of the canyon, and suddenly we were very alone. By the time we collected our packs, the relentless sun had cooked us too long. I drained the last of my liter of water by mid-afternoon. Swimming the river cooled us, but did little to relieve my thirst. By the time we again climbed the canyon walls, and relocated those rams, I was uncomfortably thirsty, but there was no time for whining. We crawled to the rimrock edge above 13 rams and waited for an open shot at the largest. Instead of wandering apart, the flock suddenly ran in a tight cluster except for the leader, which happened to have the second largest set of horns in the bunch. Fortunately, I was using my familiar Ultralight Arms Model 20 in 284 Winchester, which I've used to take much of the game over the years. It points as naturally as my arm, and I know the trajectory of its 139-grain Hornady bullet. The first shot from 250 yards stopped the ram. The second dropped him. By the time we finished whooping, taking pictures, and butchering, I couldn't make spit. By the time we'd packed that meat four miles back to camp, I was almost too dehydrated to keep water down. But I had my ram. Today, the shoulder mount on that ram reminds me that I can persist and persevere if I have to. In diametrical opposition to my desert hunt was an Alaska doll sheep hunt with too little sun. Snow was my nemesis that time, and it taught me that perseverance isn't always enough and that sheep hunters must be ready to accept defeat. We rode good horses up a braided river valley one glorious autumn day, admiring stunning mountain peaks etched against the cobalt sky. We'd already hung the quarters of a big moosin camp, and now hoped to cap that achievement with a good ram. In the warm evening light, with the tent hidden in a side stream willow thicket, We lay on the polychromatic tundra watching 80 ewes and lambs gamble and graze across a wide mountain valley. I could hardly wait for morning. With all those ladies about, we knew rams had to be near. The next morning, the world was rapidly turning white. If you've never tried to spot a white sheep against white snow fields with snowflakes falling, trust me, you don't want to. If you've never stayed in a nylon backpack tent at 10 degrees, trust me, you ain't missing much. Oh, it's a character builder, but it doesn't do much to enhance your hunting success. Frustrating and unproductive though that hunt was, I remember it fondly because it was truly a rare adventure that proved our mettle. When it became obvious we would not spot a legal ram before time ran out, we moved back to base camp and I shifted my attention to the simple joys of a snug hunter's home in the wilderness. The man-made world of grime, crime, and drudgery was far away. Pure, cold water bubbled past our camp, free for the drinking. Wolves howled in the distant hills, caribou trotted befuddled through camp. The world seemed doubled in size, its mysteries and potential unlimited and undiscovered. Beyond that tundra slope, beyond those blowing flakes, lay another mountain, another unexplored valley, and more mountains still, all thick with game. The red and yellow tundra leaves looked like sugar-frosted candies, the dark spruces like Christmas cards. No phones rang, no bosses gave orders, no antacids were required. Millions of Americans from New York to Los Angeles yearned for the chance to experience 
such peace, beauty, and wilderness camping adventure, and I was having it. Grizzlies are always the catalyst for heightened awareness in the North. They're liable to spice up any sheep hunt. During a week's horseback hunt in the Alaska Range, we rode smack into a sow with three tiny cubs. She stood her ground, towering on hind legs to full height, the better to peruse us. Stick your arms out and yell so she doesn't mistake us for moose, our guide instructed. When we did, she huffed, whirled, and ran. Two days later, in another mountain tundra valley, we broke out of a willow thicket behind a huge boar striding purposefully up the slope, going as steadily and easily as a marathoner jogging down a level road. Such sightings inspire dramatic songs and ribald jokes during midnight rides. You keep your rifle loaded and beside your sleeping bag with a zipper down. The confidence and self-sufficiency that grow from sheep hunting are wonderful rewards in themselves. During a wet 1997 hunt in the Brooks Range, I discovered the value of good equipment, experience, and a competent partner, Keith Atchison of Atchison & Sons, the venerable hunting consultant firm from Butte, Montana. Keith, like his father Jack, carries a bottomless pack that always seems to have just what is needed when it is most desperately needed. When our lunch supply ran low, Keith produced beef jerky. On our one warm day, as we sweated up a mountain, he provided little packets of fruit-flavored drink mix to spice up our water. During a heavy wind and rain squall, his ice axe propped on one quarter of my emergency tarp while we huddled quite comfortably. At that moment, with prospects for taking a sheep at their bleakest, I felt a deep comfort and satisfaction. I feel good, I said, water dripping from my hood. Uh, Comfortable, I mean. Here we are north of the Arctic Circle, three miles from our nylon tent, 20 miles from base camp, nearly out of food with the wind howling and the rain pelting us, unable to see more than a few hundred yards, and I feel confident. I guess it's all those years of hunting like this. I know what nature can dish out, and I know I've got the gear and the mindset to survive it. That feels good. Keith was similarly confident, which made us good partners for this style of hunting. We had the patience to wait out the rain, the stamina to continue climbing, a spotting scope powerful enough to spot big rams six miles across the high mountain basin, and the stalking and marksmanship skills to shoot one. They should be just up over that bench, Keith said. They haven't moved. It had been more than two hours since we'd last seen them. We checked the wind, got below it, and began the final climb, our bellies grumbling. Just as we reached two large boulders over which we could rise to see a big ram bedded on the edge of the grassy bench, another rain squall hit. This time our shelter, including our light rain jackets, was in our packs, which we'd left behind for the final stock. We were huddled against the rock until that rain lessened. Hey, he's still there, Keith reported after a cautious peek. Not one of the biggest ones, but a good 36, maybe 37 inches, I'd say. You better take him. Well, what about you? Hey, let's wait and see if another ram steps into view. We can get two. Nah, it's too risky. We need a sheep. You take it. I protested, but Keith insisted. He was holding out for a 40-inch ram or nothing. There was still a good chance that one of the many we'd seen earlier, two of which had looked pretty big, would run into view when I shot. Well, none did. My ram, which did measure 37 inches, toppled over, while a dozen smaller rams and one large band of ewes fled the scene. While Keith and I butchered our guide-scooped rainwater from a pool, fired up his portable Coleman stove, and made coffee. There we sat in the Arctic evening, drying our shirts beside a splendid ram, all the fresh meat we could use, gazing across miles and miles of undefiled mountain wilderness and drinking reviving cups of java. It's some feeling, sheep hunting, some special glorious feeling. Oh, those were some grand hunts. Yeah, that brings back memories. It's kind of nice to have all this stuff written down. Yeah, I started off my career keeping a diary, but it was so hard to do it after a hard, cold, wet day, and especially on backpack trips. I wasn't going to drag a diary around with me. So I got out of the habit 
But what I did when I got back was write the stories for these magazines, and that has really become my diary. So I can go back to the old magazine stories and and remember how things were. And sheep hunting is, gosh, those are the kind of memories that see you through the hard times and uh, and the good times. You can snuggle up against a fire on some cold winter evening and read some of these old stories, and it takes you right back to that grand adventure. But even without the stories, I still have my memories, as we all do. And I think that's such a big part of hunting, of being a hunter. It's the planning and the plotting and the dreaming of what we're one day going to do in the new country we're going to discover. You, whether you you hearken back to Daniel Boone or some old cowboy hero from the movies, but whatever gives us that idea of going into the wilderness and having those grand adventures, that sticks with you and it helps push you forward to do these kinds of trips. And I always urge young folks to expand their horizons, push the envelope and get out there. Don't just settle for another deer hunt from the same old tree stand in the same old corner of the, of the farm. If you can, plan an adventure. Even if you never get the wherewithal to make that adventure, just planning it is so satisfying. And it inspires you to do better things, to work harder, to save your money, whatever it takes. But boy, if you can get up into the North American wilderness on a sheep hunt, for me, it was the ultimate. I think it still is. Uh, one could argue that caribou are better or, or elk or moose or grizzly bears or anything. But the whole idea is to have a dream and make that dream come true. Hey, this is Ron Spomer. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time on Ron Spomer Outdoors Podcasts. And if you're listening on your podcatcher, you can also see us sit here boringly reading this stuff on our YouTube channel. Either way, we're glad to have you. Thanks a lot. Hunt us and shoot straight.